Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Final Bar. Happy Thursday, March 7th. I'm Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Should be an interesting show. We've got the market continuing to push to the upside. Semiconductor names, as always, appearing toward the top of the leaderboard. Communication services tech, both up over 1.5%. We have a great guest today, Ari Wald of Oppenheimer. Always does a great job of helping us make sense of these market trends and what to look for to tell us that uh, conditions are changing. And arguably, very little we're seeing today suggests anything other than a market that is a pretty strong uptrend. You know, still debriefing and, uh, and adjusting from the jet lag coming back from Dubai last week. But, you know, at the CMT uh, Dubai Summit that I attended and, uh, and spoke at, I mean, a big sort of discussion, a set of discussions on process, on routines, and trend following. And regardless of what market you're looking at, in global equities, most likely it's at or near new highs. That's the way you have to describe most markets outside of China and a couple outliers. But for every Apple or FXI or one of those names or Brown Foreman breaking down, there seem to be plenty of other names stepping up to take their place. That's why breadth conditions remain relatively strong, as we uh, discussed on yesterday's show. With that in mind, let's get to our market recap, talk about how the markets evolved today, what we learned from today's trading session. Before we look at the charts, Poll we had running recently, which ETF would you own for the next three months? Large cap growth, large cap value, small cap growth, small cap value. Spread between all four of them, to be honest with you, but large cap growth, which is the IVW, getting the most, uh, the most votes, about a third of the, uh, of the respondents. I wouldn't disagree, probably, although probably I would go back and forth between large cap growth and large cap value. You know, when you look at something like the IVW, what strikes me about that chart is that it's going up. And the IVW is really very similar to the QQQ, very similar to the SPY, and that's because these are the biggest weights, right? Large cap growth is certainly the bulk of the weight in the S&P 500, certainly the largest names you would describe as, uh, as, uh, as growth stocks. Now, value is interesting because some of those sectors, like we'll talk about with the Ari Wald in a bit, some of those uh, sectors like industrials, like financials, they're more in the value bucket. Those are the ones that are starting to emerge. I probably would end up voting for value only given the strength that we've seen in growth and the fact that so many value-oriented sectors have been underperforming. I think if you continue to get a bit of a leadership rotation, which I think we do, wouldn't be surprised if some value stocks start to do a lot better on a relative basis. So I'd probably go IVE, but I get the argument. And thanks so much for answering that, uh, that poll question, everyone. Let's uh, continue on here with our market recap. The major averages all in the green here. The S&P 500 up just about 1% to close, just about 51.57. The NASDAQ composite up 1.5%. The NASDAQ 100 right about the same. Mid caps and small caps all in the green. The S&P 600 uh, lagging behind slightly, but still up 0.8%, uh, so a decent up move. The VIX, no real change from yesterday, so right in that 14.5-ish range. You know, volatility in this sort of environment. I think of volatility regimes or volatility phases, right? Sort of volatility sets into a certain uh, regime. The VIX ends in a certain range for a while until something changes. And once a range is established, you look for a break out of that range. I would say at this point, I think of the VIX as settling in a range below 15, uh, which is sort of my back of the envelope. Things are getting a little dicier is when the VIX spikes above 15. That's where I have a price alert set uh, here on stockcharts.com. I would encourage you to do the same. Uh, that was triggered briefly earlier this week, by the way, when the VIX uh, spiked above 15, but it did come down and, and, uh, and close below. But by having that alert set up, I was able to uh, focus in and make sure I, I understood that potential change in the volatility, uh, in the volatility regime. VIX above 15 would, uh, would tell you something may be changing more on the tactical time frame, at least. We're not seeing it yet. The VIX still uh, remaining below that 15 level. Interest rates, a bit of a mixed bag here. The long bond yield right about where it was yesterday, around four and a quarter. The 10-year and five-year points moving slightly lower. So both of those are just below 4.1%. So we've talked about sort of that higher for longer, uh, you know, theory or thesis for uh, interest rates. When you look at the five-year, uh, the 10-year points, what you'll see on the charts is that they've been steadily coming down, right? This is after uh, the 10-year uh, yield peaked around 5%. It did go below 4% before spiking back up, and now it's sort of in the, uh, in the lower end of, the, of that range. You know, again, uh, the interest rate environment has been actually relatively stable as much as we think about, you know, rates being higher, talk about inflation uh, going out of control. All of those things have sort of been tempered, right? There was a period where we had a, a rapidly rising 10-year yield, where we had inflation that was way out of control. 
Tenure yield has stopped going up, essentially, if not going slightly lower. And inflation numbers have come closer and closer to that bogey, around 2% year over year that uh, Fed Chair Powell has, uh, has described. So keep an eye on interest rates for now. Not too much of a change. The dollar index, by the way, down about half a percent from Wednesday's close. Gold and silver continuing to be break green on my monitor. We've talked about precious metals and how they've uh, had a pretty strong uh, go of things here recently. Gold uh, right uh, moving to new all-time highs above $2,100 an ounce. The GLD right at uh, 200 up another 0.6% as is uh, silver prices. Uh, interesting to note some of the uh, gold miners actually just starting to pop up on my new three-month highs list, but not a lot of them yet. I would say still a little more to be proven there. Crude oil price is about flat from yesterday, by the way. Finally, looking at crypto land, almost all of the top 10 coins that we track on our platform were in the green today. Bitcoin and Ether prices, both up about 1.8, 1.9%. Bitcoin currently around 67.375, so very close to all-time highs, sort of in that 69,000-plus range. Looking briefly at the 11 S&P sectors, want to note that it is the FANG sectors and the Magnificent Seven sectors, two of those at the top of the list here, communication services, technology, which have really been dominating the sector returns on, uh, on, on uh, most timeframes you'd look at back from today, uh, back at the top of the list, both up about 1.6% today. Materials, number three, up 1.2%, followed by energy and industrials. On the downside, financials uh, finishing slightly lower, but just a couple pennies below yesterday's close uh, for the XLF. Pretty much everything was flat to positive. So real estate and healthcare rounding out your, uh, your bottom three. You know, looking at the Magnificent Seven is, and Friends, these are some of those key uh, growth names that I like to, uh, to highlight, some of those mega cap growth names. If you look, NVIDIA up 4.5%. Semiconductors continue to be, and Fuego continuing to move to the upside. Strong absolute terms, strong relative terms, uh, both uh, you know, continue to fire well. And a number of the uh, top 10 stocks in the S&P 500 are all in that semiconductor group. Meta number two, uh, up uh, three and a quarter percent. Apple down slightly uh, from yesterday. I actually wrote an article for CNBC Pro earlier today, which was posted talking about Apple and thinking about some potential downside objectives. Tesla and Microsoft uh, all up. So, I mean, most of the Magnificent Seven finish the, uh, finish the day in the green. Let's look at a daily chart of the S&P 500 and check in on how things played out. What you're going to notice, this trend line that we've uh, drawn and we continue to revisit, just we continue to be right within that trend line. I think we closed almost exactly on the trend line that I've, uh, that I've drawn here uh, from recent months. And again, this is just capturing the general trend here from the October low, you know, tying into those January, February lows. And we've spent some time sort of revolving around that uh, trend line support. So it's not really holding particularly well, but, but it's not going down, right? We're not sort of failing there. And what's interesting is when you do have these little pullbacks, we keep making higher lows. And that is the sign of a market in a very strong configuration is that pullbacks keep making higher lows, right? A dangerous market is when you make new highs, but then a pullback undercuts previous lows because that tells you the buyers you would expect to come in, if we're still optimistic, buyers should be buying on dips. You're getting that uh, read in this sort of environment. Most recent pivot point I focused in on, and I have a, an alert set for this level as well, S&P 50-50. I think as long as we hold that level, uh, conditions are all uh, pretty, pretty decent, right? Because that means on a tactical time frame, we've been able to make a higher low. And that's the most recent uh, swing low here, really from late February, now again from early March. We hold that level on a pullback, and that is by any definition a strong uptrend, continuing to get stronger. We break that 50-50 level. That's when I think you have now earned the right to open up some further downside targets. The 50-day moving average might be the next one. That's currently around 49.20, uh, we'll call it. So maybe keep an eye down that way. Uh, thinking of market breadth, we went through these breadth indicators in detail yesterday on yesterday's show, so I don't want to go uh, too much through it, but just to remind you, the McClellan Oscillator continues to be choppy, noisy, but overall more positive than negative. What's interesting about the chart of the McClellan Oscillator, and this is really more of a short-term breadth oscillator driven by advanced decline data, right? So it uses a derivative of advanced decline, raw advanced decline data to create this particular uh, visualization. Note, we only spent about a day below the zero line before it spikes right, right back above. That happened uh, on yesterday's session. So this is Wednesday's reading. Uh, this is not up, updated yet for today's close, but given the market strength, I would say most likely we push uh, even higher. And so that tells you, again, the McClellan oscillator remaining above zero tells you that this market is in a position of strength, and we're continuing to see that. 
I do want to look briefly at the chart of gold. We'll look at the GLD. And two ways you look at gold really on our platform. GLD is the gold ETF. Dollar sign GOLD looks at a continuous contract. So that's the uh, gold future uh, from the CME. And you'll notice that uh, gold indeed making new all-time highs here, just above 2165. Uh, and again, impressive the run that you've seen on, uh, on gold. And, you know, so interesting, you know, I think this is a great reminder of why technical analysis is so valuable, right? There will be plenty of people, particularly uh, those that know the fundamental story about stocks versus precious metals versus interest rates, will tell you why gold should or should not go up given the market environment. What I was taught earlier on, a couple, couple years ago, was that gold and stocks tends to move, uh, they tend to move inversely to one another because gold is sort of a safe haven. It has a low correlation to stocks. Um, and so generally when stocks start to uh, struggle, when they get in more of a corrective move, you look at gold as a way to diversify and sort of a way to park assets to ride out periods of instability. Has not always been the case. And a and, uh, conversation with Bob Prechter years ago, a great presentation where he showed, all right, let's think about all those sort of things we know, air quotes uh, included, about market relationships between stocks and gold or uh, interest rates and certain sectors or anything. And he was able to show you, all right, stocks go up and gold goes down. All right, here's an example where that absolutely happened. Here's a different example where the complete opposite happened, where stocks and gold went up together or they went down together. This is one of those times where both hard assets and soft assets, right? Hard assets being gold and silver, soft assets being equity prices, uh, both going up in a, in a pretty meaningful way. Gold's making a new all-time high, and the GLD is threatening the 200 level for the first time. So there's strength here. And I think the other way you can define strength in a chart like this is not just the fact that it's going up, which it is, and not the fact that it's breaking out, which it certainly has. It's the fact that the momentum is overall quite strong, right? Notice how in these pullbacks, the uh, relative strength index, the RSI, is remaining above 40. Did slightly dip below there in, uh, in uh, mid-February, but you get the idea. I'm shading this, idea, uh, this area green to show how the momentum profile is still pretty strong. And as long as that remains the case, where we become overbought when gold rallies, when gold pulls back, which it will at some point, and the RSI remains above 40, that tells you that this general uptrend is still in place. Look for signs of that changing as maybe an indicator that uh, something a little different uh, may be going on. For now, I would argue gold uh, very much in a uh, position of strength, really moving higher over the last, uh, over the last couple of weeks. Let's finish off today's market recap, looking at some individual names and, uh, and, and charts on the move. Uh, Kroger, we're going to start with the, uh, the, uh, the juicy sector of consumer staples. And this is a, a great way of just reminding you that even food retailers, which have not been probably top of my list of strong stocks to focus in on, Kroger's making a new 52-week uh, high today, and it's breaking out in a major way. What's interesting about the chart of Kroger, it's been sideways for quite some time. It started this basing pattern back in summer of 2022, and for the last year and a half plus, it's been sideways, right? Stock's been ranging between 49 and 41 on an adjusted basis. Most recently, we have this great rounded bottoming pattern, and then we broke out, and this is when it pops up on my new three-month highs list, Back here, when it's breaking above these recent swing highs, that's what I start to focus on Kroger as a potential long idea. So this latest gap higher, up about 10% today on, uh, on, a, uh, on a good earnings report. Uh, just the latest upswing, right? The latest upward move, the latest exclamation point on this, uh, on this period uh, of improvement. And you know, don't forget to look at multiple time frames, right? Zooming out at a weekly chart really shows you the rally that you saw in 20 and 21 coming out of the uh, sort of through the COVID era. 22-23, as growth stocks have been dominating, uh, Kroger certainly has not, but it turns out we still need groceries, we still need to eat, we still need personal products, and that's why uh, Kroger is actually breaking out. So regardless of what sector it's in or what that might imply, I would say it's always a good time to own good charts. Kroger is one of those that uh, seems to be turning higher. Uh, BJ, which is BJ's Wholesale Club, uh, also breaking out today. Here's that weekly chart, also sort of a similar read to what you saw with, uh, with Kroger and on the daily chart. You'll see today's gap higher, again, up almost 10% on earnings. Now, BJ is a little bit different because it did break above 74, which is impressive. But now it's up into some overhead resistance. And I think from a bigger picture perspective, now it's sort of right at those previous sort of all-time highs. Do we have enough juice left in the tank or enough gas left in the tank to propel above that previous resistance? I think BJ above 80 on the weekly chart all of a sudden looks very, very strong. At this point, I probably give the benefit of the doubt 
uh, on the bullish side, given the strength out of this uh, uh, expansion, out of this uh, this basing pattern, uh, given the higher lows on the way up here in the last uh, in the last six weeks or so. Now that brings me to Costco, which is probably my favorite example within that big box retailer type of uh, group in terms of a chart that has just been working. Quick preview tomorrow. Grayson Rose and I will be sharing our top 10 charts to watch for March 2024. One of those 10 is this ticker Costco. To get the other nine, you're going to have to watch the show tomorrow. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we recorded that uh, this week. Had a lot of fun talking about different patterns, different charts, how to think about risk versus reward in this type of environment. So don't miss tomorrow's conversation with, uh, with Grayson Rose. Now, within that same sector, this is the consumer staple sector. It's not all beautiful, right? And we highlighted Brown Foreman Group, I think on yesterday's show, I think this is one of our three and three charts. As a reminder, uh, Paul Tudor Jones famously said, nothing good happens below the 200-day moving average. And I learned a long time ago, get excited when something has been below the 200-day for quite some time and then starts to get above it. Not that that's a guarantee that it's going to be the next NVIDIA or anything, but it's not going down anymore by that loose definition of, uh, of trend. And I would say Brown Foreman Group very much did not follow through, was not able to get above the 200-day, was not able to get above the December swing high, and now we've gapped back lower. Now, after yesterday's gap down, which ended up turning into sort of a hammer candle kind of thing, it really didn't follow through today. And anytime you have a big gap, I say the day after is always really important because that's when you get a sense of whether this is something different, whether maybe uh, buyers are coming in and excited to buy the weakness of uh, BF slash B. Not the case. Uh, we continue to move uh, lower again today, almost 3% down. We're still within the range of those lows in the 52 to 53 range, uh, maybe potential support there. But at this point, I, I think uh, there's a lot more to prove on that particular chart. Uh, Smucker's SJM, a good Northeast Ohio company, also showing you why uh, a downward sloping 200-day moving average is usually not where you want to be. We see a similar retest there in late January, early February, rotating lower, now below two downward sloping moving averages. Today down about two and a quarter percent. I think this certainly opens the door back to a retest of those October, November lows. That's another 10 points plus below where we're at today. So uh, consumer staples actually sort of a, um, a mix of charts from the Costco at the top to the SJM on the bottom and maybe others in between. But as always, focus on the charts that are working. Generally speaking, I like stocks that are above the 200-day uh, not below them. As a good example of a chart that actually fits that criteria just fine, American Express. Now, I can share with you so many examples of charts that are working like this. Um, and, uh, and again, I'll talk with uh, today's guest, Ari Wald, about how to think about names that are a little bit overextended. But you know, one of the things, this is one of those times when I really like to just draw trend lines on the chart. And I've mentioned before, for me, trend lines are kind of the way you have a conversation uh, with the chart, conversation with the markets by drawing Trend lines on your uh, charts are sort of showing, here's what I'm seeing, here's what I'm thinking. And if you do a good job of saving these uh, uh, charts, um, then you can, I'm um, just putting this in a random list here. Um, that's how you can then save your trend line. And so, uh, you know, Grayson uh, has a group of lists where he saves ideas and he sort of moves them along this progression from, you know, just initial watch list to something that are really actionable that he wants to take, uh, maybe potentially make a change of position on. Uh, for me, trend lines saved in a particular chart list that I have are the ways that I focus on those actionable trends, things that I think I really want to pay attention to. And most importantly, I want to get a sense of when they change by drawing these trend lines and then having a process where you go back through some of those charts that you've saved and see how many of these are still holding trend line support, where are we seeing some change of character by breaking that trend line. At the very least, that tells you something's different. So AXP, take the October low, take the January low. We're still well above that trend line support. It's a pretty good chart moving at a pretty good clip as long as we remain above that trend line. Get nervous when that trend line fails to hold. Today is not that day. Within healthcare, we've highlighted some of the charts recently that are pushing higher. Edwards Life Sciences is one I want to share with you. This is in the medical supplies group. Uh, medical supplies, medical equipment, both have had some pretty good uh, uh, charts here recently. If you look at EW, what I like about this chart is sort of this stepwise motion, right? Look at the move off the October low, that move up to the 200-day moving average, and then a consolidation, bit of a flag pattern. We then gapped higher, closed above the 200-day, and moved even further. Then we had another consolidation, which we're arguably just today exiting. We're now getting out of that, uh, that little basing pattern up over 6% today. Now we're testing this resistance. I would say this level, which is right around 95, key level that we're at, would be not surprising to get a bit of a pullback. 
from that sort of significant resistance that I know many will be looking for. But overall, as long as we keep making higher lows, that's a chart in a stepwise motion to the upside. In general, you want to stick with charts that are working. Edwards Life Sciences, for now, one of those healthcare names that certainly appears to be doing so. I'm going to bring on today's guest, Ari Wald of Oppenheimer, here in a moment. Before we do that, just one quick announcement, and that is we'd love to hear from you. We're going to do a mailbag show next week, and we'd love to feature one of your questions on the air. You can get your questions to us via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. On the Twitters, just tag us in a comment at final bar SCTV. And here on YouTube, just drop a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to hear from you. And we'll hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag show. I want to welcome on today's guest, Ari Wall. There is the head of technical analysis at Op and I are coming to us from New York. Ari, Happy New Year. Good to see you again. How are things your way? Good to be on. Spring is coming soon. I can't wait. Spring is coming soon. The market has a spring in its uh, continuing to push to the upside. I mean, take a step back for us. We have the S&P, the NASDAQ continuing to sort of tease all-time highs. Is it still a long and strong kind of environment for you, or are you seeing reasons for caution right about now? No, we're, we're following the script uh, as much as the markets run, and some of the sentiment indicators have reached more optimistic levels. You know, we're still following the roadmap. This is the second year of a bull market. We made the case that the S&P is conservatively undervalued below 5,400. This is based on returns typically in the second year of a bull, returns that you typically see following breakouts to all-time highs. And what was the kind of lingering concern was this divergence in market breadth where some and what was a risk, we actually see opportunity as well. If that we could be a, a point in the cycle where participation actually starts to broaden to the upside. And uh, we make that claim looking at the relationship between the S&P 500 and the Russell 2000 and uh, looking at that small cap benchmark in particular in the bottom panel here, what we see uh, is an index that is just starting to break above really a two year base. And I think could offer firepower for the next leg uh, of the advance. I think if that were to occur, then you know, you typically rising tide lifts all boats. I think large caps do just as well against that backdrop. And um, for all these reasons, um, continuing to follow that roadmap that uh, higher uh, highs are ahead of us. This is a great chart. It's a weekly chart of the S&P on the top, the Russell 2000 on the bottom. It's, it's so interesting, Ari, right about now, if you had told me Apple was potentially breaking down to like a new three month low. What is the broader market doing? I'd say I probably say it's probably not particularly good, but the market's actually holding up quite well. And you're seeing other sectors really start to emerge. And I think maybe small cap improving is sort of part of that maybe rotational thesis. Is that fair to say? Oh, I, I mean, that's it. It's the bullish rotational aspect of it and kind of looking at the internals of the market. You know, we're still far from the as good as it gets moment. I mean, mm. the, mar the market internals are still behaving that this is early to mid cycle, you know, let alone end of cycle. Uh, and so for all these reasons, um, you know, again, the, the action we're seeing, uh, you know, we think is a support for continued gains. Yeah, and I don't remember the particular date you were last on the show, Ari, but I do remember particularly you were pretty optimistic and, and the markets have, have followed uh, what you discussed quite well. So kudos to you as, uh, as always. Your second chart here is a really interesting one. You did some really interesting work on underperforming sectors, what that tells you about the overall conditions. Talk us through this one and what it's telling us here. Now, this is our sector culprit indicator. And what we've, uh, again, we're arguing against a market top. And what we found is that at a market top, not only does internal breadth typically narrow, but that weakness is typically concentrated as well. But there's typically, you know, one S&P sector, at least that's already down 20% over a year over year basis. And that's what this uh, indicator is showing. It's just the rolling return of what the bottom performing S&P sector is at any point in time over a prior 12 month basis. So currently utilities are the bottom performer without about a 4% loss over the prior year. And that reading is actually improving. You can see it's, it's moving higher. So again, this is another measure that depicts early to middle innings bull market behavior. Typically the as good as it gets moment is when even the bottom performer is up 10 to 15% year over mm. year. When an investor can just throw a dart, put all their money into what becomes the worst sector bet possible 
and still have a great year, still be up 10 to 15 percent. <laughs> so uh, and, and you can see that you, you usually get to that point at least once, you know, a cycle. And so yeah. we haven't seen it yet. And we think that point could be ahead of us. Yeah. And that's where this would get up to the upper end of this range. Right. When sort of that lagging sector all of a sudden is still doing uh, it's still doing quite well. So maybe further runway uh, in front of us here. Now, if we do continue to get this rotation away from the mega cap growth stocks, which have done such a, a dramatic or have been, really been leading the way higher. Where do we go next? Capital markets is a group you wanted to highlight. Why is that? Yeah. So, you know, as far as where you want to be, I still think tech, large cap growth, that's a core position. Some of those names selectively are consolidating here, but I think the long term is still intact. Uh, we also like industrials and, and really the tactical idea here for us is financials. Financials broadly, I think, it is a group that really stands to benefit from this rebroadening of the market. And it goes beyond just the big banks, which have been in discussion. And uh, we're calling out actually the capital markets industry, which we think is to posi positioned to outperform on both a near term and long term basis. Here I'm uh, highlighting the its ticker KCE. It's an equal weighted ETF that tracks the industry. So you get some of that mid and small cap exposure. Mm. And we can see that relative ratio is curling higher. So it's really the broadness of strength uh, within that industry that adds to our conviction as well. It's so interesting. We've highlighted recently on the show some of the regional banks like uh, Keycorp, Fifth, Fifth Third, others, I mean, really starting to rotate in a, in a way that I think is surprising a lot of people. We've sort of mentally written off financials for, for long enough, I feel like. You know, so given the fact that the market's sort of in this upper trajectory, what would be sort of that warning sign that things are starting to not be as optimistic as, uh, as you've correctly been here? What, what's sort of that red flag chart you would look for? Is it the S&P breaking down through a particular level? Is it more a rotation to more defensive areas of the market, uh, an increase in volatility? Like what would tell you, OK, the, the, uh, the music is now stopping. I want to maybe get more defensive. Sure. Well, first off, we have our roadmap. You know, historically speaking, 70 percent of bull markets make it to at least their two year anniversary. Mm. Uh, historically, you don't get a market top and, you know, especially as we overlay the U.S. presidential cycle until the post election year. Now we're looking for our indicators to either confirm or deny, deny that roadmap. As it stands, what we think is that they're confirming that roadmap, that, that we should see strength uh, continue through the balance of the year. But um, of course, what would deny it is is a lot of those things that you mentioned. If we were to see a turn in leadership towards more low volatility defensives, not seeing any of that. Utilities, consumer staples coming off of multi-year relative lows, significant underperformers as the pro-cyclical themes outperform. We'd be looking for uh, a breakdown in market breadth to see that, you know, instead of Russell 2000 position to break to the upside, if that starts to go the other way and starts to break down, that would be a key concern. Uh, credit spreads widening. Uh, you know, there'd be a laundry list of things we'd be looking for, none of them, none of which are, are really flashing right now. Uh, that's fair. Spreads are narrowing. Uh, pretty much all the things you mentioned, the opposite is happening. It's, it's sort of in that bull market trajectory. I'd love to ask you, in our market recap, we were talking about a number of high-flying names. One of the names that we, we mentioned was uh, Costco. And while we think of NVIDIA and On Semiconductor, those names as just you know, being you know, consistent outperformers, some of the big box retailers like Costco have done very well. And, and again, you know, sitting on pretty significant gains just year to date. What do you do with, with a name like this that has already had a run? And you're, you know, I, I think for a lot of investors, it certainly feels like it's overextended. How do you sort of think about this on the long term and also on the tactical time frame, what's your approach? Well, one of the, the key tenets to what our what we advocate for is to let your your winners run. Mm. This is this is a stock that's has been on our buy list and continue to be uh, should, is going to remain on our buy list. This has been a, a long term winner for us that we think could continue to do well, especially in a difficult consumer st staple sector. It's really the the food retailing industry where. You wanted exposure, Costco, Walmart, check out the action in BJ's today. Nice breakout to the upside. Uh, and so with a name like Costco, if you're worried about overbought conditions, you've been out of this thing the whole time. If you worry about overbought conditions, you don't like bull markets. Overbought conditions are a function of a bull market. If you worry mm. about an overextended bull market, you miss the chunk of some of the best rallies through history. And, and it's so important to have those big winners to offset the small losses. So I get it. I get asked about those questions. It's not tactical. It's overbought. But heck, I don't think I, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with my ability to sell that stock 
and then get you back into it as well. I mm -hmm. think it's more to, to let to ride that trend, uh, which is pointed higher in our view. Just one last question, Eric, to finish up. This has been awesome. Uh, I appreciate it so much. We have the Fed meeting coming up later this week. I mean, basically, general sense is no probable change in, in Fed policy, but you know, certainly a lot re relying on what the Fed may do and rate cuts and what that might mean. As a technical analyst, how do you approach something like the Fed meeting? Do you just consider that that sort of change, that sort of nuance would be reflected in the chart? Or is there something you would be looking for or thinking about as we sort of go into this next, uh, this next Fed cycle? No, I, as a technical an, an analyst, analyst, we are a, um, a student of market history, and it's important mm -hmm. to understand how these market cycles develop in conjunction with Fed policy, which has been a big driver of those cycles. And good, they shouldn't cut. I don't want them to cut. We got <laughs> the, the key worry. We, we got into that bear market in 2022 because of this threat of runaway inflation and the, the fear that this was going to be another 1970s. And their mistake in the 1970s was they cut too quickly. And you did get that flare up and spike in inflation once again. They don't want to go back to that. I don't want them to go back to that. In fact, we, we show some studies that once the yield curve is inverted, uh, the time to you're usually closer to your market top when they actually start to cut interest rate policy. Mm. You know, why are they cutting interest rates? Because the economic activity would be deteriorating. Uh, so for all these reasons, um, you know, we're going to be watching. We're going to be watching the market reaction. Um, but, you know, our, our kind of feel is that the market um, that, you know, obviously I'm not a Fed uh, analyst. I don't have a view on whether they, they cut or don't, but I'm kind of thinking that they stay the course and, um, and I think that'll be good for markets. Really appreciate your comment there at the end, Ari, about uh, as a technical analyst, being a student of market history, I feel like I've learned a lot from uh, talking to sort of our predecessors, looking at some of those historical markets. Hopefully we can, we can keep applying those lessons here today. Ari, great to see you. Uh, thanks again for coming on the show. We'll look forward to the next time. We'll be back soon, Dave. Thank you very much. Take care. That's Ari Wall. There is the head of technical analysis at Oppenheimer coming to us from uh, New York. I love his comment. I mean, again, when we brought Ari on uh, in recent months, he's been correctly focusing on the strength of this market. And I think his chart highlighting the uh, you know, participation in small caps, pretty impressive. You know, a lot of people have been talking about how small caps have not really participated, which you have to remember is as long as they're not going down, it's not usually a bad thing. It can be just sort of a leadership rotation uh, challenge. I think ta thinking about uh, you know, sectors, groups like capital markets and others, those tend to be a little more heavy heavily weighted in the small cap space than in large caps, which is dominated by those growth sectors. So maybe a rotation to more value-oriented sectors gives the small caps a pop and gives further fuel to this fire that continues to rage for the uh, markets. Great take there, as always, by Ari Wald of Oppenheimer. Folks, we've got to wrap the show and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. We're looking at the S&P 500, and we're looking at a market sentiment indicator called the AAII survey. I haven't talked about this too much on the show recently, but uh, we have uh, brought it on occasionally. This is the American Association of Individual Investors. This is a weekly survey of retail investors. Comes out every Thursday, midday Eastern time, if I remember right. And the most recent reading has the indicator just above 50%. So I did a quick historical study. I have this horizontal line in pink showing you where we're at right now, around 51, 52%. And looking back to see how often we've been at this current level. I started putting vertical lines at previous times when we've been up uh, at least above this current level. When we got back to 2006, I started getting lazy. I'm like, this happened way too much back in that period. So I'm just going to shade this entire area uh, sort of amber just so you know that it happened quite a bit. You can see those levels. But you know, really starting after the 2009 low, a couple observations. Number one, this happens pretty often, right? Uh, and, uh, and so remember that this indicator, uh, this survey, actually has quite a bit of fluidity. And I would say that, you know, on the upper end, you rarely get above 60%. That's only happened uh, a handful of times going back uh, historically. You very rarely get uh, bulls below about 20%. That's sort of the lower end of this range. And most of the observations, obviously, sort of uh, in the middle somewhere. But the fact that we're this high basically lines us up with some of these previous points. So observation number one, it happens pretty often going back a couple times a year, probably. Observation number two, there's only a couple times where this particular signal was at a major top, right? I mean, most recently, we got that right at the uh, sort of mid-2023 at the June peak. You know, looking back here, what other times happened right before the 2018 peak? 
you know, happened here right at, I mean, the top in 2007, noticeably saw that up there. Um, so that's observation number two. Observation number three is there are a bunch of other observations that happen mid-trend, right? So if you look at the average time when this has happened, it's not been a topping signal. It's actually been more of a sign that we're in a healthy bull market phase and that there's probably more room to run. I think of this as a contrarian indicator. I think many do. But when you look at the raw data, when you actually look and uh, sort of do, this is just a quick visual back test, for lack of a better description, uh, it's not always a bad thing. So we are above 50% bulls. I don't think that necessarily means a, a bad thing. And, and to be honest with you, I think going back, it's actually quite constructive. Now, the way that you confirm that it's not a major top is use more of the trend following approach, right? What was different on some of those major tops is that the price changed very soon after. And that's what I would be looking for here today. Chart number two, looking at long-term uptrends. Our guest today, Ari Wald, I thought some great charts and really good conversation as always, but he focused on the um, uh, uh, capital markets sector or capital markets group within the financial sector. That is uh, KCE is the ticker for that equal weighted capital markets ETF. I looked at some of the holdings. It's an equal weighted ETF. So these are not the largest holdings, but they are certainly in the, in the top holdings. Uh, LPL Financial, which is a big um, advisor network, uh, Piper Sandler, PIPR. Um, you'll notice that both of these are pretty good charts. So when you know KCE as, a, as an ETF is doing quite well and starting to emerge, I would say a lot of the individual names, uh, this is a weekly chart of these two stocks going back for the last five years. You can see they're actually either breaking out as Piper Sandler is doing uh, in the month of March, or they're very close to doing so with, uh, with LPL uh, close to a new, uh, new multi-year high here. So there's a strength in, uh, in some of these uh, stocks within the financial sector. I have learned to go where the money is flowing. Price is the best representer uh, or representation of that. Maybe look in the financial sector, particularly the capital markets uh, ETF. Finally, Edwards Life Sciences. I mentioned in our uh, market recap how names like this are interesting, uh, compelling to me because of this stepwise motion, right? You have a, uh, an influx of buyers. You then consolidate where buyers and sellers are in equilibrium. Then you gap out of that range, and then we consolidate. We are just gapping out again toward a pretty significant uh, high going back in uh, summer of 2023. But overall, I love this higher highs, higher lows, stepwise motion. At the bottom, I'm looking at Edwards Life Sciences versus the healthcare sector in blue, Edwards Life Sciences versus the S&P 500 in blue. Great trick I learned from uh, Gaddis Rose years ago is looking at relative performance to different uh, sleeves of the market, right? So is the stock outperforming its industry? Is the stock performing, uh, outperforming its sector? What about the broader market? Here you can see EW is not just outperforming the S&P, it's also outperforming the uh, healthcare sector. So names like this that are uh, leading names and leading sectors, just emerging with some relative strength are always potential good opportunities in my book. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A special thank you to Ari Wald of Oppenheimer joining us from New York. Uh, we're going to have a special episode tomorrow, Top 10 Charts. For March 2024 with my friend Grayson Rose. No show on Monday. I'll be traveling to New York City. I'll be there all next week uh, doing the show remotely uh, until uh, the week after that. So have a great uh, weekend and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye now.